All right, we're here with Dave Roberts, and Dave is a friend. He is a pastor. He's our pastor at Montrose Church right here in Montrose, and I'm so glad to have you, Dave, and thank you for making time to be on the hey. podcast. Hey, John, it's nice to see you, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah. Well, um, we're having this conversation because you wrote a book, and I said, Let's have you on the podcast because I appreciate who you are and your teaching and just your person. And I, and I like the ideas in the book and I want to get that out into the world. And I thought we could start with a quote that you have in the book. It's from one of our favorites, Sung Shimai's favorite, Henry Nouwen, because it's about hospitality. And that's actually what I hope this podcast is about. And so I'd like to read that first. Sure. He, Henry Nouwen defined hospitality as the creation of free space with a stranger where a stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but you offer them space where change can take place. It is not to bring men and women over to our side, but you are free. You're, there's freedom not to disturb by dividing lines. Yeah. So you, you wrote that in the beginning of the book. I love it. I hope that's who what we can experience here today. I mean, you're not a stranger. I'm not a stranger, but sure. you you put the, well, the quote in the book. Can you comment on that? Yeah, one of my favorite authors, obviously, and uh, and I think uh, probably captures in a lot of ways my whole philosophy of ministry, which is you know that's what the church is supposed to be. You know, we're supposed to provide this safe, loving place where people can enter. They can bring whatever it is they have, whatever brokenness, whatever hurt, whatever pain, whatever baggage, whatever habits, whatever failure, uh, you know, whatever uncertainty, whatever it is. Uh, and we're not trying to change them. We're creating a space where they can be loved and the power of God and the Holy Spirit can do whatever changes the Holy Spirit sees fit to, to, to convict of and empower. Uh, so I think it's, a, it's more than just a now and quote. And, and it sort of drives a lot of what I think the book is centered around. Yes, beautiful. And yeah, thank you for um, just, I think that's why Sung Chim and I sent God leading us to Montrose, because we sense that, we experience that in your personhood and in the leadership and in the, in the community as a whole. So thank you for creating that space where we can just come as we are. I think, I think if, the, if you can't be yourself at church, what, where and and I know you can't. I mean, I know in large part that is a great, that's a big ask. But uh, if you can't be yourself at church, where where on earth can you be yourself? Well, when when you say that, that's I hope that's the kind of environment we can create. I think of a quote by Gabor Mate. He says the two things that we're working with in life is attachment and authenticity, and those two things we usually we can do one at a time but to do both so if we're attached to the church or the people at church or christ at church we can do that but we might give up what you're saying is some of that authenticity of who we are our struggles our strengths our gifts yeah well and i you know i think that resonates with me because i think everything is intention you know mm. uh, mm -hmm. justice and mercy are intention you know mm. a whole the idea of holiness is tension it's, it's mm -hmm. holding all the virtues in perfect balance, and obviously only God can do that. But uh, I think you, I think we are called as the people of Christ and the church to live in the messy middle, to, mm -hmm. to live in the space where we don't give up either. Uh, we don't go, you know, in any direction, whether it's political or whatever, whatever the movement is, whether it's social or psychological. We're, we're those people that we're going to hang on. We're going to hang on to attachment, and we're going to hang on to. Uh, you know, authenticity, because that's our call, and it's not easy. Right. Um, but that's really where we're invited and called to live. Yeah. No, thank you. And so you're, you wrote this book, Healing Conversations. I have read it. Um, it's Healing Conversations, Talking Yourself Out of Conflict and Loneliness. So this has your signature all over it. When I read it, and what I know of you, and the sermons I've heard of you, and the conversations we've had, so it, it's a beautiful book. What, can you tell me what motivated you, inspired you to do this? And I'm sure it's been a long time coming, you know. Long time. Yeah, embarrassingly long time. I, I think the whole project was six or seven years long. Um, but 
but a lot of that was we I, i've always wondered are the things that we talk about as a congregation do they have any mm -hmm. uh, you know any sort of uh, feet outside of uh the walls of our congregation mm -hmm. and so i you know i don't know I, mm -hmm. I haven't really known that and so when this process started it started from a sermon series the sermon series was called balanced it was from the book of james mm -hmm. And uh, it really talked about a broader scope of being balanced in our lives. But there was one particular piece of that series that was about balancing our words. Hmm. And so the more that I started trying to kind of flesh that out, the more I was drawn into this reality, you know, conversation and the way we connect verbally, uh, that's our hope. That hmm. everything that happens, I think there's a Frederick Beekner quote in the book about this wooden tongue. And the idea that, you know, with our limited words and our limited ability to, to use language, everything has to happen. All the art, all the history, uh, all the connection relationally, all the healing, it all has to come through these formed words of conversation. And so mm -hmm. uh, as that conviction kind of took hold, um, I think just then trying to step in and go, well, what do I know about conversation? What do I observe about it, really? I mean, 30 plus years of listening to people tell their stories, open up their hearts, watching communication, watching what happens when it breaks down, but watching how healing it can be when the breakthrough happens, when, when the right words get spoken, when the right things are coming out. So I think all of that sort of came together and then over several year, years with a, a great book coach um, mm. uh, who really challenged me in a lot of ways and helped me learn how to write effectively. Mm. Um, you know, Susan Stroh is her name. Um, uh, just just processed through and, and the project finally became what it is today. Well, that's a cool part of the story that, and I, what I meant by saying it a long time coming, meaning like this is a part of your heart and it's like your life story and your pastoral, pastoral ship. But then you know the journey of taking, oh, I, somehow you, you came to write a book, like, or the idea first came to you. What, how did that happen? Where did that, was it a conversation? You know, um, you know no, I, I think I've always wanted to write, like from a crazy early age, you know, uh, I don't know why, probably because I love to read. I mean, I just have always loved to read. And so I've always thought, wow, I admire people who can form mm. things into storytelling and words. And uh, But I also really felt like, you know, you can't write a book until you have some miles on you, you know. Mm. And so uh, I've sort of laid that part aside. And, you know, my kids are grown. My last daughter graduated from college a couple of years ago, a year ago. And... Uh, you know, uh, for the first time, I was really able to go, I think it's time. I think I can set aside all those other things. And, um, and you know, I think to be able to sort of focus in now and explore a whole different kind of vulnerability, by the way. I mean, you know, you think if you write to speak every week, that's vulnerable. That's nothing compared to writing your words down in a book. And why is that? Tell me more. Like, why is that more? Why does that feel more vulnerable for you? Um, well, one is because I think as a pastor of a church, people vote with their feet. Mm -hmm. So I say this, you know, I'm involved in mentoring younger pastors and other pastors. And uh, one of the things I talk to them about is I, you don't know if you're a good speaker or not. You, you are an affinity speaker. The people who stay at your church like you, the ones who don't go somewhere else. So are you objectively a good speaker? I don't know. But you, you, have, a, you have a following. So that's very different. You know, people are choosing to show up and they're choosing mm -hmm. to hear you. Uh, that's different than writing down your thoughts on paper and they're open to people's interpretation. They don't know you. Mm. They don't have your heart behind it. They don't have a history with you. They don't have a relationship. I tell our young staff, uh, you know, you know, develop great relationships and you'll be a better speaker because the more people like you, the more they cheer for you when you're in front. That, that's wow. just true. So I think the book puts you in space where it's really your thoughts and your words, and that's all you have. Yes. The relational component may or may not be there. Yeah. 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 Well, um, you know, the, you, you talk about the, um, there's seven aspects, seven things, and we don't have to go through all seven, but of the seven, 
I'm just wondering, even today, in this real, real time, real moment, anything that stands out to you, and then I'll draw some out too, but I wanted to start with you. Of the seven, what comes to the top of your mind or your heart that you would uh, like humility. to draw? Humility. What is it? Humility. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the ancients said humility is the, it's the core virtue. All the other virtues grow out of humility. Yes. I, I just think, you know, and in the book, I define humility as, um, you know, I don't know very much. I believe a lot of things, but I don't know very much. Mm. Um, and I think that, the, the, you know, uh, I guess I just see so much conflict in our world. And this is true in relationships and marriages and families. Uh, you know, uh, you do this. You know, I, I, I say I, what I do is pastoral care. What you do is counseling. I don't really do counseling. But, but in that environment, you know, you sit in a space and there are, there are so many times, and maybe I get to do this and you don't because you have to, you have a code of ethics that are different, but I always tell people, I'm not a counselor, so I'm going to tell you what I think. Mm. I'll be blunt and I'll be direct. But, but how often I, I have to say, uh, how did you figure out that what you're telling me is right? Mm. When did you come to believe so vividly that that this place where you are is the place to be and the people around you need to move. Hmm. Um, and I think that's our whole world. Yeah. I mean, our whole world, everybody has decided where I'm sitting is the place and everybody else should move. Uh, and yet none of us know, hmm. we don't know. Um, yes. We believe some things, we've experienced some things, we talk out of that, but we don't know. And that changes the conversation. Mm. That opens the door. If I know and you don't, if I'm smarter than you, we're not going to have a conversation. We may mm. have a debate. You know, we, we may have a, 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 a monologue, but a we're not going to have a conversation. Right, right. It could be a teaching, a st yeah. teacher-student, but not a dialogue, a conversation. Yeah. yeah. So humility, and then you say it's, it's I don't know much. And to how do you, what do you do? Well, Dave, we assume that you and I are humble, right? You wrote the book. So. One of my best features. <laughs> you know, one, I, Dave, I really resonate with you. And when I'm reading this book, I'm like, oh my gosh, Dave and I are brothers. You know, I mean, like even the Henry Nouwen quote. And um, it, I think at the end, you close with uh, St. Francis prayer or somewhere in there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Love that too. But I really think humility is, I'm glad to hear the, um, it's one of the core virtues. And I, what I would add is I like to, I want to behavioralize this. And it's like, it's, it could be like, I could be wrong. You know, like, can that not be a true statement in yeah. every situation? I may have strong convictions, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, and what happened to you? And, you know, you know, the scripture says is iron sharpens iron show. So one person sharpens another, but we don't sharpen each other because we don't allow, there's no space for that. You know, I, I'm, I'm in the mode mostly of, you know, trying to dominate. Uh, you know, I just feel when you listen to people on TV, I mean, how, how upset people get. And I hear this all the time. I've taken a break from social media because it's just depressing me. I can't watch the news anymore. Well, I get that, but in another part, I'm like, but, but those people don't know, you know, they don't know. They only bother you if you believe, you mm. know, they're somehow saying something that's wrong, but they have authority or mm -hmm. you, you know, so I, I just think, man, we could all slow down a lot and make room. And that's that back to that hospitality. I'm not trying to change you. I yeah. want to hear who you are. I want to see how you see the world. I want to see what you're thinking. Mm. Yeah, that's really to be, um, to, and you talk about in there, like the threat of to be known and to know and to love and be loved. Yeah. Like That's the kind of people that we want to be. Yeah. And these healing conversations, healthy conversations, that's, you need that for, to become a kind of people. Absolutely. And yeah, that, takes I, a, that takes a huge amount of safety. Mm -hmm. So we talk about trust. We talk about who you're letting in the castle, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and that whole conversation is not really about keeping people out of your castle. It's yeah. about letting the right people in because when people get into your castle, they can do tons of damage. Uh, but if you don't have anybody in the castle, that's a lonely, eerie, not happy place to live. 
So uh, I, I think, you know, those elements of, it takes tremendous safety mm. to get there. So what I'm hoping is these elements start to make sense on how you progress to get deeper and deeper into the castle and develop healthier relationships and conversations. How do you see, as just a leader of an organization, of a people, of a community, creating safety? I mean, because I think one-on-one, -on -one, that's necessary. So I'd like to hear on that. But then how do you do it in a, like your sphere of influence? Well, I, I mean, I, I think at a personal level, I feel like if, a, if I have a microphone and I get to stand up in front of people and I get to talk, I have an awesome responsibility to represent all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I'm not allowed to create paper tigers and rip them apart. I'm not allowed to uh, disenfranchise someone uh, by being insensitive to their perspective. I, I think the church ought to be diverse. It ought to be people full of people that have very different perspectives and come from very different backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, but have come together for a greater good. And so I think how you instill that in a in a group is you don't take advantage of your ability to uh, be one-sided. I think okay. you, I think you must talk about things in the same way um, that represents humility. You know, mm. I don't know this. And I tell this to our younger teachers on our teaching team, mm. but Hey, they don't want to know what you know. They, they've heard a million sermons. They want to know what you're struggling with. They want to know what's hard for you. They want to know why you feel depressed or why you feel overwhelmed or why you can't figure out how to apply that scripture to your life. That's what people, that's what makes sermons meaningful. Uh, and, I, and you're probably back to that issue of authenticity. If I just stand up there and say, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, you can run a church like that but I'm not sure that you're representing that sort of safety, that sort of ability for people to be human. Because mm. uh, I know I grew up believing the pastor had it all together. <laughs> you know. And you know, you're the pastor and you know you, you don't have it together. And I think our people know that I don't have it together. <laughs> well, that's because you, you share it. You do share it. And then, which is actually, you model, I mean, you wrote the book, but you model the self-disclosure. So you're not just disclosing how Dave is like always winning, you know, like, <laughs> right? That would, that would imply that that would happen somewhere. <laughs> well, you know, hopefully there's some of those, but you, you do, you, you model the struggle, the journey, the, the wrestling with the failures. And yeah, that's yeah. one of the things that you, one of the seven things was self-disclosure Yeah. and self-disclosure serves what purpose? Well, I think I, I say in the book, we don't know very much. So if we don't know very much, you know, then what do we have to talk about? Mm. Our journey. Us. We're an expert on one topic. What mm. happened to us mm. and how we felt about it and mm. what we learned from it. Mm. And, and, and to me, experiences are what connect people. You know, pain, disappointment, you know, feeling let down. Uh, we know what we're supposed to say, but, but do we ever talk about what's underneath that? Mm. Yes. You know? And I think if we can get into that, that's what self-disclosure is about. You know, there's so often when someone is here and they're talking about something in their life, and I know that I've been through that, that what I want to do is go, hmm, yeah, that's really hard, and this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. What I feel prompted to do is say, well, let me tell you, I've struggled there too, and let me tell you how I struggled there. Now, it's not, that to me is one of the most um, difficult things to do is to be in that space of saying, well, just so you know, uh, I not only understand what you're saying, I've experienced what you're saying. And here's how I went through it. And this is what happened. Uh, I, I just think, how do you help people if you can't say, you know, this is, this is, this is what's inside. This is what's yeah. going on underneath the surface. And, you know, yeah. So I, yeah. No. Then I think that's that's you do model that in the in the sermon, and then you you teach about or you write in the book about the importance of self disclosure, so that almost like what's inside of Dave or John can be known to, and then you you're revealing like I'm human like you too. 
maybe in a very similar way or just in the in the way of I struggle yeah back to what you were kind of saying yeah well and you know you've heard the old saying you know it's my insides looking at your outsides mm. and, and if we're never going to have great connection or conversation as long as that's true yeah because you know I will choose to see in your outside the best part of you you have it together you seem completely collected and connected and smart and you know, great relationships and everything's working for you. Mm. Um, and my insides are a mess. Mm. So mm. how could we ever be friends or, you know, I mean, we could be friends, but only at a sense that I admire you or I, you know, but we, when we let that go and we go, well, the truth is we're all kind of a mess in a different way. Yeah. Um, and when we can get into that conversation and own the ways in which we are a mess, uh, it's really, one of the fascinating things to me is because people think they know me. You know, they hear me talk for yeah. 30 minutes on a week and then they optimistically for 30 minutes on a week, sometimes more. But, mm -hmm. uh, so they know me, you know, and, and they make assumptions about me. Uh, and so then it's, it's often surprising to them when I'm like, yeah, your impression is completely wrong. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's just completely wrong. So uh, even like things like anxiety, because, you know, I deal with some anxiety and the process of writing and researching and getting up and delivering and, you know, and, and I think people think, Oh, you know, they just, that's just so fun for you. And you just, you know, uh, I like it. Right. But I don't feel confident about it. I don't, I don't walk away from a weekend and go, mm. man, we just knocked it out of the park. I walk away asking, what did we miss? Did, mm. did it, did, did we do that? You know, around here we, when things are normal, we get to do four services. So the sermon gets delivered four times. Wow. And every time that it's over, you go, okay, I really didn't, I really need to clean that up. Obviously it was, yeah, I should have done this and not that. And then when the day is finally over, I usually sit down and go, oh, now I understand what I should have talked about, you know? So yeah, I think just yeah. that difference between what's going on inside of a person versus what you might perceive until we break those walls down, it's, it's really hard to have healing conversations. And I, I, I really like, um, you add curiosity in there. And what's interesting from this point of the view of the brain, we're only curious when we feel safe enough. Yeah. And to be, you know, I have to feel like I'm, my, I'm okay for me to be curious about your world. I, you know, I had a pastor that was my mentor, my, the, the first pastor I served under when I was a youth pastor, uh, who thankfully I still get to work with now. Hmm. Um, but uh, he had this unique ability and uh, I, I didn't understand it so much when I was, you know, 20 years old and starting out. But he would stand at the back of the church on a Sunday and greet people as they exited. And in that brief moment, whatever that was, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Sometimes a long conversation would be a minute. Mm. He had the ability to make you feel like mm. that he was absolutely tuned into you. Mm. And, uh, and I think curiosity was a big piece of it. He mm. genuinely, when he said, how you doing? What's happening? He really did want to know. It wasn't just a greeting. Mm -hmm. And I think that ability to say, I'm curious about you. I'm curious about what's happening to you. I'm curious about how you see the world. Uh, I think that piece, you know, it comes out in so many places. When you're in a meeting and something's going on and you know someone's been quiet, to just say to them, hey, you know, you've been really quiet in this meeting. I'd really be interested to know what you're thinking. Because it's probably they're opposed to whatever's getting decided, but they don't want to be that person, you know. And so that's freeing, that's liberating. You know, somebody wants to know, somebody's curious about what's going on. And so I, I think curiosity is a big deal. Wow, I love that you um, draw out or at least pay attention to it, the person who is not verbalizing something and you create a little space, a little hospitality for them because you're curious what's going on for them. Yeah, think... They're usually the smart people in the room. <laughs> they're the profound people, you know. Well, um, that's, and you know what? I bet they feel the care and the love, even if even if you decide to go a different direction. To be seen and heard is really how we feel loved. Uh, 
it's so it's so huge. It's just, uh, you know, I, I think if you want instant connection, and I've said this before, you know, you go and you meet somebody and you talk and uh, you just had a great time. You just had, we just had this wonderful lunch together. It was unbelievable and amazing. And somebody says, well, what, what'd you talk about? Um, me? <laughs> we talked about me. And then you realize this person, whoever you were with, made you feel so valuable and mm. you really did spend the time because they kept asking you questions. Yes. And you know, there's an old A.A. Uh, a. Milne quote, you know, who wrote Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. Uh, if you read the original one, uh, he says, uh, you know, here's Christopher Robin coming down the stairs and blah, blah, blah. He has this introduction and it says, uh, and what kind of story uh, would Winnie the Pooh like to hear tonight? And Christopher Robin says, he'd like to hear a story about himself. Those are his favorite kind of stories. And I think uh, mm -hmm. in a very big sense, that's true of all of us. You know, our favorite stories are about us. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting because how do we, we do need those spaces, right? Where we can be seen and heard and known, and then we can give the gift of, of that for others. Because I'm thinking part of what we need to do is to know other people's stories. Yeah, oh. I think about it with my grandkids, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, what, a, what, a, what are they feeling, seeing, thinking, observing, and to just ask them, you know, what's happening to you? What, what do you think about this? Uh, mm -hmm. They have brilliant answers. You know, there's so much going on inside of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's one small sample of how, you know, and, and I do think the more that they are allowed to just talk, the more mm -hmm. they like to be around you. Yes. You know, they don't like to just be told, yes, no, don't, what, you know, let's do this, don't do. They like to talk and they like curiosity. So I think it's really fundamental. You know, what? Uh, one thing that Sung Shim and I teach, we talk about the yes brain, no brain, which we take from Dan Siegel. And um, the no, we turn the no brain on when we do it. No, do this, don't do that. But the yes brain is basically like your whole book is about creating a yes brain state which is where someone feels accepted, loved, welcomed. And um, you, 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 like, you're giving some ingredients and stories and ways that people can experience how to be in this relational state so that we can experience more hope and healing. One of the things you talk about is affirmation. And you know, like what, anything that comes to your mind, but I was thinking, I'll tell you, because one of my values is, you know, this is a podcast. I'll put it up on YouTube as well. But even just modeling people, that's how we become a kind of people. We see it modeled for us. Yeah. Dave, could you and I just take a moment to affirm our spouses? So, sure. so could you say something genuine? You, I didn't prep you. What's something, I mean, I think you can do it easily, but what's something that you really affirm and appreciate and see in your wife? Uh, well, Cindy's very uh, organized. She's very structured. Uh, she thinks in very specific categories, and she has a very specific kind of uh, process to her thinking. Mm. And so I think that keeps me, who I tend to be a little more mystical, and I tend to drift around, and I tend to have a lot of ideas, but they don't necessarily get legs, and they don't necessarily get, you know, um, and so I, I think to affirm her for that structural piece of her life where um, she just has a, she has a very high personal accountability level, mm. Um, mm. you know, uh, for, and, and, you know, that for our home, for our family. But, you know, I think that reality of um, she is very task oriented and, she uh, she holds us all sort of in a in a place where, uh, wh however the crazy of the world is, it still moves forward. It's mm -hmm. always moving mm -hmm. forward. You know, I experienced that with her when um, Sung Shim and I were working with her to get the um, texts out for you know during those weeks, and she was so wonderful to work with because she kept us organized and moving forward, but in a like a fun, delightful way. And so I experienced kind of the, the beauty of what you're saying about Cindy. So I guess it's my turn to say something about Sung yeah. in, in a way, just in a way of modeling, um, 
you know, I can relate because Sangshim and Cindy have some similarities. Sangshim is, um, I will learn about 15 things at once and be interested in explore different things, but she can zone in on one thing and go deep and intense and focused. And I mean, actually right now she is um, reviving her Japanese language. She, wow. she um, used to, that was her undergrad degree, Japanese language and literature, but she's on online and she's like, that's all she's doing when she's free. I mean, she's helping take care of the house and stuff, but sure, she's sure. working, taking yeah. care of the house with me. And then she's on this um, site learning Japanese and she's competing against other people and she wants to be number one. So, <laughs> Always so good. I, I, I love that about her. So um, yeah, but just, that was just a, a way of modeling two men appreciating their spouses but what else would you say about affirmation in the, from the book or from just in your heart? What's in your heart? Well, I just think, uh, you know, um, I think we are so uh, success oriented in our culture. Mm. And I think that trip dribbles down into conversation in the sense we, we have a tendency to decide, was that a good conversation or a bad one? Mm. Um, and there is nothing more debilitating to ongoing health and conversation and communication than having communication. And then at the end of it, having someone say, well, that was a waste of time. Mm. Uh, that doesn't motivate you forward. You know, uh, you don't, you know, I think people will invest time and energy and focus. If at the end there is an affirmation, listen, this mm. was hard. I'm not sure we resolved everything. But I am so glad we talked. I'm so thankful that we were able to be in this space. Listen, we've talked for an hour and, and we've both shared and, and we've made progress. And maybe we don't feel like we're over the hump and maybe it feels like more things got drug up and I may feel a little worse now than I did when we started, but I'm thankful that we're doing this. I'm thankful that it happened. You know? uh, I just think it's so important. Uh, you know, we are, we are such creatures of... Um, I don't know, we're so homogenous in so many ways. Mm. Uh, we are drawn to positivity and we are, we are pushed away from negativity. And so even when, th especially when things are hard, yeah. especially when conversation is difficult, to have the grace to say, thank you. Yeah. I, am, I, I just want to say, here's what happened that I just feel so good about, mm. you know, um, I, I just think it matters. And at the end of the book, there are these, you know, little exercises and I tried to model them after that so that, you know, there's sort of a, you know, what do you believe? And then there's kind of a conversation about curiosity and self-disclosure. And then at the end, there's after everyone is an affirmation. How do we affirm what happened in this discussion? Because I think yes. that matters. And what I see, Dave, you're doing is you're really, um, the words flow out of, you're affirming we're in relationship, we're connected. That's like, that's where the safety comes from is, oh, I see you as a human being, we're on this journey and I'm glad we're connected. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I think too, and we didn't say this a minute ago, but you know, when, when you have, there used to be, you know, an eyewitness to an event that was solid evidence. Now it's almost worthless because we've come to understand that if you have 10 eyewitnesses to an event, you have 10 stories. Mm -hmm. No, they don't necessarily corroborate. And so when that gets into emotional space, hmm. to, to take the time to say, uh, what happened to you? This is what happened to me. Yeah. I, I acknowledge that this is what I believe happened. I don't know what happened because none of us do. Um, but I would like to know what happened to you. Mm. And even if I don't agree, I, I can't deny what happened to you. And so I think that being in that conversation and just being able to affirm that much you know. Yep. Well, um, you know, there's uh, if I want to kind of end with something, but first, if people want to get the book or be in touch, like what, how can they do it? Well, right now you can get the book through Amazon. You can get it on Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can get it uh, books a million, uh, almost any online retailer has the book. Uh, it, it actually, I think is shipping now, but it's official release date is July 7th. Uh, we will be doing a few more events if you're local to Montrose, Pasadena, uh, Glendale. We will be doing some book signing events where you can get the book. And But 
right now COVID's kind of keeping that from happening. So, yep. so uh, it's so out there. Go there and okay, great. And then um, just, I would like to end with two things. One, what's your hope for the book? And then when you're done, just imagine the people who are listening, they've listened, they haven't turned it off. They're still listening for those who are. Yes. What, how would you want to bless them? So what's your hope for the book? And then almost like, like a, give a um, benediction. Okay. Well, I think the hope for the book is that it could somehow create uh, practical steps mm-hmm. that would help cure the divisiveness in our world and culture. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, our politics are invading our homes. Um, our cultural differences are invading. I mean, I know parents who have a difficult time talking to their children. It breaks my heart. And my prayer is that somehow, rather than just being in conflict, this this could help put some vocabulary and some steps and some, you know, build some bridges, uh, create some priorities, you know, for parents to be able to say, would you read this? And could we practice this? Could we have this kind of respect for one another? Could we have this kind of honoring of one another? Because we, we, we're heading down a path, and I, I want us to reverse that trend and go, even if we never agree, even if we're on far sides of all of the issues, we, we're still a family and we need to learn to talk together in a way that's edifying to all of us. So yeah. that would be my prayer for the book. Amen. That it could make some difference in that. Amen. Uh, and a benediction to you that have hung in there. Uh, I think my prayer for you is that you would find a place uh, where you could be known and you could fully know, where you could love and be fully loved, where you feel like somebody sees you and gets you uh, and values you because of that, because of who you are and how you're made. And you don't have to, at least you have a circle of people in your life with whom you do not have to pretend. You are just yourself and you are safe in that space and you can come to that sanctuary whenever you need it. And then you can go out and uh, do what you need to do in the broader world. But uh, that would be my prayer for you and the blessing that I wish for you. I affirm that and second that and hope to see that that's what people experience and we become that kind of people Amen. as followers of Christ. So Dave, thank you so much. I see you as a good man who embodies these things and thank you for being with me. And it is an honor to be friends with you and Cindy and Sangshim and I really appreciate you guys. Thank you, John. I so appreciate it. And we love you guys so much and appreciate what you do. And uh, we're just so honored to have you lead and share your gifts because uh, it's a it's a huge blessing. Well, thank you. Well, look forward to our next conversation. So take care, Thanks, Dave. God. God bless. God bless.